Hi. Good afternoon. On behalf of Luis, Luis's family, I'd like to thank you all for coming out on this rainy Saturday afternoon to celebrate the life of our dear, dear friend, Crispin Hollings. For those of you that don't know me um, and or weren't at the reception yesterday at City Hall, my name is Scott Butcher, and Crispin was my dearest and best friend. <sighs> the event yesterday at City Hall celebrated Crispin's big, big life. We heard from members of the community and civic leaders about how dedicated Crispin was to making San Francisco and the world a better place. Today's different. Today's about the Crispin we all knew one on one. About the Crispin that made you feel like you were the most important person in the room when you were with him. We're gonna hear from family and close friends about how important he was to them. After that, we'll break, enjoy some refreshments, and tell stories about Crispin amongst ourselves. Our first speaker this, more, ah, this afternoon sorry, is Lex Rof Rofenberg. I probably got that wrong. The nephew of Crispin's first partner, Eric Rosefuss. Ah, all wrong. So <laughs> sorry about that. So uh, Lex, come on up. It was a little wrong, but it's okay. There's no wrong in grieving. Um, I'm Lex Rofberg, and um, I was Crispin's nephew, and I was Eric's nephew, and I am Luis's nephew. Um, there were some incredibly touching words yesterday, and um, something was unsaid. Uncle Crispin had an incredible mustache, <laughs> and I, I think it's unconscionable that we did not hear anybody say that directly yesterday. So I wanted to lead off there. All-time mustache, Uncle Crispin. And I, I'm, I saw photos of him as a child without a mustache, and I was very confused, because I, I assumed that he emerged into the world on day one with a mustache. So this was news to me, but here we are. Um, I, I need to start with a story, and the story actually doesn't involve me directly. It's 2015. And Crispin Hollings is heading on a trip to Providence, Rhode Island, which is where I live and where my now wife and then girlfriend Valerie lived. And he shoots me a note. He says, hey, Lex, I'm going to be in Providence. Are you around? Dang it. I'm not. I'm not going to be around. Um, but he doesn't stop there. He says, oh, well, is Valerie around? And she was. And he gets in touch with her. And they end up having a great time. Um, and I, I want to break that down for a second, because let's, let's determine the relationship between Crispin Hollings and Valerie Rofberg, then Valerie Langberg. Um, this is Crispin's deceased partner's brother's son's girlfriend. <laughs> I, I did some, you know, mental machinations that basically this is his niece-in-law in law which is, I don't think, yet a real term that we use. Um, but Uncle Crispin not only wanted to see her, made it a real point of the trip to see her. Because that's what he did. Because he understood that she was family. I've never not known Uncle Crispin. I met him for the first time when I was one year old at he and my Uncle Eric's commitment ceremony. I know that not because I remember it, but because there are pictures of a very small, round me. I'm less, my, my mom jokes that I've stayed the same weight since then, I just grew upward. Um, but that day in 1992 is when I met Crispin for the first time, and it was at their commitment ceremony. And Eric Rofus was my uncle by blood. Um, but that day Crispin, did not become my official uncle by law that day. I use that phrase niece-in-law in law. I actually kind of want to inhabit that phrase because I don't think Crispin would have created that word niece-in-law if he were at the meetings where he decided the words in the English language because for him, he knows that family isn't something that is defined by legal statutes. And family isn't even something that's only defined by blood. 
He, understand that better, he understood that better than anybody I knew. Um, but so he didn't technically become my uncle in law that day because as it turns out, laws are messed up a lot of the time. Crispin knew that, we knew that. And um, in 1992, it was not permitted for my uncle by blood, Eric Rofus, and Crispin Hollings to become lawfully married. And, and indeed, they were never allowed, despite uh, a couple month period in 2004, to become fully lawfully, quote unquote, married. And I wanna bring that up today because first off, Crispin spent his entire life speaking out in the face of unjust laws, so we might as well do so today as well. But the second reason is that Crispin Hollings never cared that he wasn't, by certain definitions, my real uncle. Never mattered. One iota, one bit. Um, he understood something deeply, and it's the greatest teaching he ever gave me, which is that the categories of family by blood and by marriage are insufficient. They don't do it. They don't do the job. Family transcends those two categories. When Uncle Crispin died, I spent a lot of the day on Facebook. First, I posted myself, but I, I read a lot of other posts all over Facebook. And as it turns out, Crispin Hollings had a whole lot of nephews. <laughs> a whole lot of people all over Facebook. Crispin Hollings was like an uncle to me. And my guess is that some of you are in the room right now. And others are watching on Zoom right now, and others are all around the world. And I want to take a second, and if you're one of those people who saw Uncle Crispin as, as your uncle, but maybe not by blood and maybe not by marriage or even close to marriage, I want you to take a second and breathe in fully that you were family, that he saw you as family. Because I learned from Crispin more than anybody else in the world that family is expansive, and he saw people all around the world as his family, right down to that niece-in-law-in-law in Providence that he had met one time and for whom he made a point to see them. My uncle Eric died in 2006, suddenly and tragically. I was 15 at the time. In 2009, Crispin flew to Milwaukee for my high school graduation. In 2013, he flew to Providence, Rhode Island for my college graduation. In 2017, to Middletown, New York, with Luis. Uh, Luis was also at my college graduation. They both came for my wedding to Valerie, who's here today. I don't think a person in the world would have blamed him if after Eric died, he'd become distant from me. I don't think anybody could have blamed him, and I wouldn't have blamed him. Interacting with me every time, by definition, was a reminder of the loss he had experienced of somebody he had loved. But Honestly, my life, which I can break into two 16-year periods, one where I knew Crispin as Uncle Eric and Crispin, and one where I just knew Crispin as Crispin and Louise, I've become closer with Crispin in the last 16 years, when my blood relative wasn't around. Le just last year, when we came to San Francisco, my, my wife and I, um, Crispin and Louise sat at the airport for two hours waiting as we sat on a lovely United Airlines plane on the tarmac after we had landed, but we sat there without a gate. Um, even though we texted, like, you can go home, we'll get an Uber. But that's, that's not something that they were gonna do. Crispin and Luis were gonna wait, and they were gonna pick us up. And then they were gonna host us for our entire trip, even though we were wandering all over the place. They wanted to be that for us, because they knew that we were family. So I want to close by something, but by doing something that's a little bit unexpected, maybe. But it's because I want to enshrine fully that Crispin was my family. Um, when my uncle Eric died, the state of Massachusetts actually didn't initially want to recognize that he and Eric were family, and so it feels important to me to enshrine in a room full of people, fully, truly, that he was, to our entire family. And so I actually want to say the Jewish morning prayer, Kaddish. And so not everybody, I'm sure, knows this prayer. Um, and what it means doesn't matter. Um, what it's for is to establish somebody as a loved one who you cared about and remember them together. And I, I want to do this for a couple reasons. One, by the official you know, Jewish rule book, um, side note, I'm a rabbi, so I can talk about the, the official rules or whatever. Um, I'm not supposed to do this for Kirsten. Not supposed to do this. 
One, because he's not Jewish. He was not Jewish. And Kaddish is sort of a prayer you say for Jews, generally. Um, and the other reason is because he was not a nuclear family member. And of course, those two reasons are precisely why I want to say it together. That a set of rules say that we shouldn't. Because there's nothing Crispin would enjoy more than a big old room full of people standing up against an unjust ancient set of rules together. So we're going to do that. And if you don't know the words, all you have to do is know one, which is amen. And I'm going to pause at the moments where we say that. If you do know the words, I invite you to stand, uh, to say, say them along. But I'm going to invite everybody to stand for this and take a moment. Whatever your relationship to religion, to God, like none of that matters. This is about our collective love for Crispin. So we'll say this prayer. Yitgadal v'kadash shmei rabah. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Tushbachata v'nechemata da'amiran ve'alma v'imru. Amen. Yehe shlama rabba min shmaya v'chaim aleinu ve'al koyosh ve'tevel v'imru. Amen. Ose shalom b'mromav hu ya'ase shalom aleinu ve'al ko Yisrael ve'al koyosh ve'tevel v'imru. Amen. Uncle Crispin, I love you. I'll never forget you. Zichroncha livracha. May your memory be a blessing. Thank you. Wow. That's, that's hard to follow. <laughs> Lexi was so proud of you when you became a uh, rabbi. I remember talking about it a lot. Um, I'd met Christmas sisters over the years at a few celebrations and never really got to know them. Over the last week, I've had the privilege of spending some private time with them. They're two amazing, amazing women. And I'd like to bring both Charlotte and Jean Hollings up, my friends. Hello, I'm the older one. <laughs> I just want to get that straight from the start. <clears throat> um, my, our cousin, Jock Darrymple, who lives in Scotland, couldn't be here, but he wanted to be here. And I have, what I'm reading is something that he sent. Crispin, a vibrant person, outward going, with so much energy and courage, through which he had forged his own distinctive path in life. And with a gift for friendship, it was so good to connect with him twice in the last 15 months. First in September 2021, a brief encounter with him and Luis at King's Cross, and then lunch in Portobello, Edinburgh, on our promenade last July when we talked deeply. He seemed to enjoy his relationship with his cousins and to view the connection with his UK family as important, something he communicated in a heartwarming way. On our part, we as a family will never forget the effort he and Paul made to get to my mother's funeral in January 2017. I have memories too of his and Paul's visits to Lukey in their teenage years and of meeting him in Lourdes at, the time, at, that, at that time when he worked in a bar there for a summer through the good agency of Michael. Community was obviously of importance to him and through his upbringing, connected him with faith in church, though very understandably he distanced himself from the Roman Catholic variation of that. <laughs> I also had a particular connection to him through our mutual cl closeness to Michael. Michael was our, our uncle, a, a Catholic priest. Um, such a big personality, Michael, 
with his flaws as well as his gifts, and I believe a major influence on us both. I particularly enjoyed the annual cartoon Christmas card, the last one with the unlikely image of a ha haloed angelic winged Crispin <laughs> dominating my desk as I type. And a particular sad sadness, his death came when it did, given Luis and his plans to relocate to London, so that it looked likely that we'd be able to meet much more often in our declining years, but no decline for Crispin. He'll remain, he'll remain for me in my mind's eye as he was that final July 2022, lunch outside in Scotland, by the sea, warm, alive, honest, real and fun with that loud distinctive Hollings laugh. <laughs> and I just wanted to add one more note that a memory that I that I had it's 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 really it was a newspaper article in Richmond um, probably back in the 80s and 90s and it was these protesters protesting gay people homosexuality and they had this great big banner that said homosexuality is a sin. And there was people in the Richmond community who went down there with their own banner. And they stood in front of the first banner. So it blocked out the final words and they changed it to say, homosexuality is fun. <laughs> <laughs> and this is, this is how I always think of Crispin. It's, you know, it was all about, well, I think I've said enough. <laughs> 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 uh, thanks for coming everyone. Um, you all know Crispin well as an adult, so I thought I would share some stories from his childhood. You'll see that Crispin has really always been Crispin. At a young age, my mother remembers asking him, are you a good boy? To which Crispin replied, I pretend to be. <laughs> Paul very graciously let me have that story, so <laughs> thank you, Paul. <laughs> Crispin also had a knack for getting what he wanted without the losing side feeling that they had lost. Charmingly conniving or connivingly charming. <laughs> Crispin was also, he was very much into acting. He even appeared in a Saturday morning TV show along with taking parts in many plays. One time the role he coveted went to someone else. So what did Crispin do? He oh so innocently went out to play with this other boy so he wouldn't have time to learn his lines. Crispin got the part. <laughs> Another time, our parents went out to dinner and left us to fend for ourselves with leftovers. We all wanted the mac and cheese. My mother made it very well, and my father really liked it. But there was only enough for one. Crispin kindly offered to heat everything up, after which we'd figure out who would have what. While preparing the various leftovers, Crispin added just a drop of green food coloring to the mac and cheese. <laughs> and that was all it took to get that dish all for himself. <laughs> Crispin was always on the go, off to Berlin or London with his dearest Louise. Coffee, lunch, dinner with a friend or two or four. The gym, a run, protest, board meetings. Maybe even he did a little work, we're not sure when. <laughs> he lived his life to the fullest, doing more in 61 years than most of us can fit into 161 years. His death leaves a huge hole in all our lives and he'll be sorely missed. I didn't know all of what Christmas was involved in, how incredibly active he was in his community, but I was always proud of him and the way he lived his life. No apologies, no excuses, no regrets. I read a quote recently, actually this morning, from Zora Neale Hurston that summed up his attitude well. She said, sometimes I feel discriminated against, but it does not make me angry. It merely astonishes me. How can any deny themselves the pleasure of my company? <laughs> it is beyond me. And that's exactly how Crispin would feel, but he would also so much want to be a part of all this. He loved being the center of attention. <laughs> so life well lived. Thank you. They are wonderful. Um, 
Crispin and Louise's wedding at City Hall some nine plus years ago was the event of the season. And I'm sure a whole lot of you were there. And if you were there, you might recognize the next speaker who officiated the wedding. Please welcome Jewel Gomez. So, <laughs> um, one of the things that Crispin appreciated about me was that I was a um, diehard lesbian feminist anti-colonialist with <laughs> anglophilic tendencies. <laughs> so, in honor of Crispin and his family, I fly my freak flag for you. <laughs> um, I, I want to say these words uh, for myself and for my spouse, Diane Sabin. Um, Diane was a very dear friend of Eric's for years. And after he passed away, Diane started having tea every week uh, in the Castro with Crispin as a way to process grief for both of them. And through that, I came to know Crispin more and then we came to know Luis more, and it ended up they were our favorite double date. Movies, dinner, or lunch, and a chance to talk to people with intelligent conversations, deep opinions, and culture. And I think we sometimes forget how important culture is in our community, that is our specific specific communities, but also at the world at large, that culture is the thing that carries us forward and bears our humanity. And we got that from both Luis and Crispin. Uh, in the um, celebration yesterday, many public officials cited some of the really vital conversations they had with Crispin, and that even when there was disagreement his energy was so positive and his dedication to his community was so strong, they could come away from disagreements with him uh, feeling uplifted, feeling like his support for a community was never gonna waver. That's a really great gift to give to someone, particularly people working in politics. They need to understand and see the support for community is unwavering, even while they go off and do the scary things that they have to do. Uh, like all of you there, there are so many things we could point to that we loved about Crispin. His solidly informed and very strong opinions, his curiosity about others different from himself, he was an astute conversationalist. He could have a conversation with almost anyone about almost anything for almost any length of time. His progressive activist impulse, and I think that's really significant because many of us don't come into this world with that. Some of us develop it, uh, and as we get older, it's harder to hold on to that idea that I am a progressive activist and everything I do every day is in, should be informed by that. That was Crispin. His amazing blue eyes. He rivaled Paul Newman. His really amazing musculature. I mean, his gym buddies know that he worked to keep it going. It was, it was like enviable. His sly sensuality. You could see it in his eyes as he looked at other men. He and I had one thing in co another thing in common, which was our love for people in uniform. Um, and that is not why he went to work for the sheriff's office. But, you know, he, he was never late for work. Um, when I officiated at Luis and Crispin's wedding, one of the wonderful things that I noticed, well, a couple of things I noticed. 
One was how deeply held their love for each other was as they looked into each other's eyes. And them both having had big, deep loves before this relationship, I felt strengthened them to go into this relationship, Luis and Crispin, with each other, having had those earlier loves. But the other thing that I noticed was when I looked out at the people like I'm looking at you all, and, and some of you were probably there, um, there was a real sense of how love not only flowed from them, Louise and Crispin, out to you, but how that love flowed back. There was a real sense of waves of love coming toward them as a couple, as a support for them, as a gift for them. So I think ultimately, one of the most uh, extraordinary gifts that Crispin gave us was the ability to be present for us when we needed him to be. He helped many of us learn how to feel our love deeply and how to show that love, how to show that love and express that love to people we care about. That is an extraordinary gift that Crispin, I think, shared with us. And it's one that we, going forward, I think, should try to share with others. How to feel that love deeply and how to share that love with those you care about. Not often an easy thing in this very, very difficult world and time. I wanna thank Crispin for sharing his love with us, thank his biological family for sharing him with us, and thank Luis for sharing him with us. And to just to say, we'll always be there. You can't get rid of us now. Thank you. You know, I was going to talk about um, how family is more than just biological, but I think Lex did a really good job of that, and I'm not going to try and commit and <laughs> compete with that. So um, without further ado, I'd like to uh, introduce my uh, brother by another mother, uh, Billy Lemon. Um, good day, everybody. Um, you know, uh, so my name is Billy Lemon. Uh, I am the executive director of a nonprofit that Crispin loved uh, very much and uh, and saved quite literally. Um, Whew. I, uh, I, I, I spoke yesterday, so um, for those of you that are here today, uh, I went home last night and uh, panicked in a downward spiral, uh, trying to think of how I could show up as another version of myself and communicate something that merited the impact that I wanted to make. And let me tell you, that's hard. Uh, my partner, <laughs> God bless him, my partner last night, he said, he finally just said, will you, can you, can we please just go to bed? Um, you're gonna show up and you're, if you tell the same thing that you told yesterday, it's going to be fine. Um, Here's the thing, I'm, I'm seven years sober, right? or nine years, oh my God, I just said seven, I lied on stage. Um, I just turned nine years sober in November, I'm super nervous. Um, I turned nine years sober in, in November because of the Castro Country Club, because of the place that Crispin, through his activism, helped save. 
And like I said yesterday, we see about we see about 5,000 people a month. And those are a lot of lives that are being saved by the work that your brother that your brother did. Um, and uh, in the grand scheme of things, I was, I was more of a professional colleague to Crispin. And so when Scott and Luis asked me to speak on both days, I said, I'm not, I'm, I didn't ask them why, I just said yes, because that's what I'm supposed to do. I wanna, wanna touch on something though that I th thought about yesterday. Um, uh, who in the room, two any, does anybody two-step? Ah, there we go. There they are. So, um, I'm, I'm 50 years old. Um, I, I didn't have the easiest time coming out. Um, but when I eventually did, I, I found myself in what a lot of us call uh, the city of love, right? Like this was uh, Shangri-La for, for, for gay men. And I, when I finally got, when I got sober and uh, I met my partner, uh, our first date was at Sundance. Uh, Sundance is this, uh, this two-stepping, um, line dancing club uh, for gay men. And, and many of you know that Crispin was a very, very good dancer. And the reason that, the reason that I had our first date, I asked Michael out and I said, I want to go to Sundance. And he said, oh, what, what, like, what is that? And I was like, oh, it's this, like, two-stepping club and you get to wear like tight Levi's and you can wear, you can wear your cowboy boots and it'll be super fun. Um, and the reason I wanted to do that is because I had fallen in love watching Crispin and Luis dance at the Castro Street Fair for so many years. And there was this one moment at the opening of the Castro Street Fair in probably 2017. I think they had the hardwood floor set up in Jane Warner Plaza and it had just been set up. Uh, and there were Crispin and Luis, just on the floor by themselves. It was magical. Uh, and it was a memory that I held on to, and uh, um, Michael and I, we did not get to get uh, personal lessons from Chris, Crispin. It was, he kept bugging me, but I was also intimidated by him. <clears throat> I cared for him very much, and he was a very special man, and he will be very, very missed. So in that wormhole last night, I, in that two-stepping wormhole that I went down, <clears throat> uh, I came across this, uh, I came across this song by Brad Paisley. <laughs> <clears throat> I'm going to finish. It's, it's also, you know what? Also, I wanted to re I want to remember. So, as as gay men in their 50s, like I'm a gay man in my 50s, we lost a lot of folks to AIDS. And I can remember, I live in the Castro and work in the Castro, like two blocks from Crispin and Louise. And is it, there's nothing more magnificent then walking to work and seeing these two or seeing them walk down the street holding hands every day. There's like one other couple that I know of that does it. It was so heartwarming and it was so inspiring. And you know, I, it's something I strive to be with, something I strive to be like with Michael, but you were absolutely an inspiration. And we don't have as many, we don't have that many role models. So many of them passed away. You were such role models for so many of us. So, um, anyways, uh, 
The song is called uh, When I Get to Where I'm Going. And it goes a little bit like, I'm not going to sing. I'm not, we're not doing that. Um, it says, uh, when I get to where I'm going, the first thing that I'm going to do is spread my wings and fly. And it's got a very nice little two-step beat to it. And when it said fly, I was like, oh, that's kind of like, that's just, that's just a chef's kiss. It involves airplanes. And I just, I'm, I feel very privileged to have, uh, have been asked to be a part of this. Uh, I am forever sorry for your loss, for the family. And uh, Luis, I love you very much. So those of you that were there yesterday um, at City Hall, you know what a moving and special uh, event that was. And it couldn't have been made possible without the sheriff. Crispin and the sheriff had a partnership and a friendship that was amazing in, in city politics. And here to talk for a few minutes is Sheriff Paul Miyamoto. Hi, good afternoon. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to again speak to Crispin and what he meant to me as a person uh, beyond what we shared in our relationship and in our job at City Hall working for all of you. Uh, I was so happy to see the family and so many members of the community there yesterday uh, to have the opportunity to, to do this again, uh, you know, uh, is, is a blessing to me because Crispin meant a lot to me, uh, not just as a coworker. Uh, he was what one of my colleagues had mentioned, and I mentioned it yesterday to all of you. He was described as interestingly fabulous by one of our coworkers. And uh, that was in the context of uh, a time we spent together working at City Hall and working for the city is very challenging sometimes. And uh, Crispin's perspective and insight and, and just, you, you all know who he is, I don't have to tell you that, but what he brought to the table, uh, the many times, uh, the fortune I had in just sitting down with him every morning uh, after he finally broke away from having coffee with half of you in this room <laughs> and actually came to work. Uh, <laughs> you know, for the few moments I got to spend it in his office, uh, he would throw his, uh, his green spreadsheet hat on, and I knew that was when he was getting ready to work. And, and he was, uh, we were able to share many moments where we would just talk about anything. Uh, he gave me insight uh, in what his opinion of, in what my daughter's opinion was of uh, the world. And uh, I shared with her some references that he shared with me uh, in raising her and uh, my other children. So I appreciated that. And uh, I appreciated our dialogue. We talked about so many different things, and I think I enjoyed more taking ourselves out of talking about the city and politics and our job, uh, working in public safety, and just being able to just be people together uh, was really important and uh, something that I hold close to my heart. Um, mentioned he was interestingly fabuli fabulous, but uh, on the job, he could be a tenacious pit bull for us in his advocacy for uh, what he thought we needed to do the things we need to do for the community. And uh, his tenacity was welcome for us. Uh, but what was great is, as he sat at a table, even though people would roll their eyes at some of the things he said, they would also roll up their sleeves and work with him. And we would get things done. And I appreciated that from him and what he brought to the table. Uh, we have a I just, I'm sorry. I have the, the flyer from yesterday, <laughs> and uh, I just looked at his picture here while I was pulling my notes out, and uh, that smile, that smile, I just pictured him in the green mustache <laughs> from St. Patrick's Day. I made a comment about that yesterday, and uh, I just saw that now. It just hit me. I, I really did appreciate, though, Crispin, 
he embraced our, our vision, our vision of reform and change to make things better, uh, to try and help other people. Uh, I know that the intersection of what he did for the city and his beliefs and you know, working with me and the time we shared together, working for our office, um, he really was making a difference for everyone and uh, making sure we positioned ourselves to help people. I did want to recognize, though, Luis, no matter how committed he was to us, the commitment he had to you, and I mentioned it yesterday in my comments, you were his before anyone else. And uh, I don't know how he fit 24 hours of the day with everything he did, but he always went home to you, and that was important to see. And uh, Thank you again for letting me take a moment to share um, with everyone what he was doing at the few moments he was actually at work <laughs> doing his job. <laughs> so thank you. And uh, Crispin, I know you're up there. Um, we have a saying in public safety and law enforcement that's when somebody moves on, um, we let them know that we have the watch and that we will continue to do the good work and share the same beliefs and values and continue the good fight that Crispin fought for all of us. And I just want to let you know, Crispin, we have the watch now. Thank you. The next person I have to introduce is really easy because she wants to introduce herself. <laughs> Chalson. Thank you very much for that. Um, the reason I wanted to introduce myself is because I don't get the opportunity to do something like this. In fact, I've never had the opportunity to do something like this before. So, hello everyone, I'm Jocelyn, and I'm Crispin's mother's goddaughter. In other words, I'm his god sister. Um, Lex did an amazing job of, it, of describing uh, wider families, and I can't really do it as well as he did. But anyway, that's what I'm gonna try and do. I originally came to live with the Hollings for a year and ended up staying for 10. It's thanks to this incredible family and everything that they've done for me that I'm able to become the person that I am now. So thank you to all of them. Now, Crispin. The, the first time I came to the States was on Labor Day in 1973. I landed at Dallas Airport where I was met by various Hollings and a teenage boy who introduced himself in a very precise English accent. Hello, my name is William Plumtree, he had pronounced. Whilst it soon became apparent that this was not a prim English boy, but Crispin having me on, this proved to be the beginning of a beautiful friendship. We shared the top floor of 511 South Lee Street in Alexandria, where we happily laughed and joked, until on a regular basis, Crispin's father, Tony, would shout upstairs, Decibels! Decibels! Will you two be quiet and go to bed? A bit more giggling, and off we went to our separate rooms. Since then, Crispin and I have both tried to follow the Monty Python mantra and to always look on the bright side. He always made me laugh. The last time I saw him in October, he had me sitting with tears rolling down my cheeks as he told, me his, he told his mother some complicated and totally fabricated yarn about gay telephone marketing. <laughs> Crispin always went in his own direction, happily moving through life and experimenting from an early age, like the time he jammed his shoe into an escalator to see if he could stop it. He could. <laughs> age 12, he used his earnings as a newspaper boy to fly to England to visit some of his British relatives. When he was 16, he went to boarding school in England where my father was a headmaster. All went well until one evening when he drank a little too much illegal alcohol and was caught. The punishment was a caning by the headmaster. My father felt dreadful about it, but he didn't think he could make an exception to his young American ward. When Crispin reflected on it many years later, he held no grudges and just claimed it hurt a bit at the time. Whilst at boarding school, he continued with his passion for flying by taking Concorde 
from London to Bahrain in one of his school vacations. <laughs> Throughout his life, Crispin continued to come back to the UK to visit his British relations. The Hamilton Dalrymples in Scotland, the Gibbs, the Carlyles, and his Hollings uncle and aunt. He often came up to Cumbria to see me, his god sibling. We had both vowed in 1973 that if ever we had children, we would ask each other to be godparents, just as our mothers had done. So when, in 1991, Leonora was born, he agreed to be her godfather. Like everything about Crispin, this was not a conventional relationship. As a young child, Leo saw him on periodic visits to the UK with Eric. There was a memorable Cumbrian Christmas when Crispin and I decided that we needed some eggnog. Unable to buy cartons of it from the local grocery store, we made it from scratch. Crispin, as always, loved the large quantities of double cream involved, and my mother and Eric were the willing recipients of the gallons of yellow nectar that we produced. We had a very jolly few days. <laughs> it was not until 10 years ago that Leo really had the chance to get to know her godfather on her first visit to San Francisco. She and her sister Oki were staying with Luis and Crispin while her father and I were staying a few blocks away. Each morning, the girls were taken out for breakfast. The journey would take some time as Crispin would greet every person they met on the sidewalk with a beaming smile. This is my goddaughter. <laughs> Leo loved it. Leo took great pride in Crispin, counting herself very lucky to have him as a godfather as he also became a good and valued friend. In fact, when she announced to me that she was engaged, she added that she wanted Crispin to walk her down the aisle and give her away. The only reason he didn't was because her mother insisted on doing it herself. <laughs> During the wedding, he and Luis quickly made themselves known to most of the 120 guests. One young woman was delighted with the charming American man that she was dancing with, announced that he was a professional ballroom dancer. <laughs> Of course, she believed him. <laughs> and for the next half hour, she explained to him that she was getting married six weeks later and that she wanted to be able to practice doing a solo dance and she was nervous. So Crispin, during the course of his goddaughter's wedding, taught her a routine that she was then able to do when she got married. <laughs> and a video was sent afterwards of her actually performing this routine. So thank you, Crispin. <laughs> um, the, for the week before the wedding, Crispin and Luis relax, uh, spread a relaxed feeling around the house, laughing and helping, making sure everyone was happy, whilst at the same time ensuring that they were both immaculately addressed in identical, unforgettable outfits of the big day. Some of you may have seen the photos yesterday of them with matching glasses, matching ties, and the most polished, beautiful shoes I've ever seen in my life. For both my daughters, any family event was fun with Crispin and Luis there. Leo, Oki, and her cousins mastered the art of line dancing under Crispin's tutelage. They also learned in a game of charades what happens when waiting in the line to get into the Bergheim nightclub in Berlin. That was quite an education. <laughs> Crispin never did anything by halves. Whether it was eating clotted cream, he got through two pints in two days with his brother, or eating his grandmother's chocolate biscuit cake recipe. He also quietly questioned things that most other people accepted. This has been alluded to already this afternoon. At Starbucks, he would always give a woman's name when asked what to put on his coffee. It's thanks to him, I shall now be known as all Starbucks baristas as John. He also used to check into hotels with different titles. We couldn't understand why he and Luis always got such nice rooms. He admitted on one occasion that when booking online, he put his name down as the Reverend Hollings for that particular visit, but quite often he used doctor. <laughs> when he and Luis were staying with my daughter, Oki, in London last year, Oki came back to her flat to find her entire freezer filled with mochi all because she'd mentioned that she liked them. <laughs> Crispin had an amazing ability to be completely non-judgmental, to accept people as he found them. The warmth of his personality and his ability to connect and to listen enabled him to develop lasting friendships with so many people he met. 
his underlying sense of humor carried him through many situations and made him such good company. He and I had known each other for 50 years and he always made me laugh. However, there was also a deeper side to him. He spoke to me about how over the past few years he had consciously tried to spend as much time as possible with family and close friends, knowing that relationships were at the heart of his life. His most important relationship with was with Luis. Luis enabled him to do this. He was always so supportive, adding to the light-hearted approach Crispin took, making arrangements and providing a secure and stable framework from which Crispin could be himself. We are incredibly grateful to him, to Luis that is for this, but also to Crispin for bringing Luis into our lives. Luis, you and Crispin made the perfect team. We have all loved getting to know you over the years with your visits to the UK. We very much hope that this will continue. Over the past two days, we've all spoken about what a large character Crispin was and the hole that he will leave in our lives and how much we will miss him. It goes without saying that this will be the most keenly felt by you, Luis. I know only too well it's not much fun being widowed. However, I hope that in the days, weeks, months and years to come, we will all be there to support you. Thank you. So we've heard some wonderful stories and memories from family and friends. I invite you now to go out in the lobby, enjoy some refreshments, and please uh, exchange memories of Crispin amongst yourselves. Thank you very much. Yes, it's going out there.